All right, so today I'm in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. I've got a couple of stories that I'm filming, and between this video and the next video, we're going to be uncovering some really awesome history. So Point Pleasant isn't really known for a whole lot, or rather it wasn't known for a whole lot, until about 1966. And in a span of 396 days, between November 15, 1966 and December 15, 1967, Point Pleasant would find its place on the map and become known worldwide. In the next video, we're going to talk about what happened on December 15, 1967. But today, we're going to talk about what happened on November 15, 1966. Join me in this very special episode of Legends and Tales Cryptids as we cross over into West Virginia to talk about the Mothman. December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. This would bring the United States into World War II throughout 1942. To aid in the war effort, the United States government would wind up getting businesses involved to help produce arms and ammunition as well as vehicles, tanks, that kind of thing, to help to, help to win the war. So one company that was actually contracted to build several new facilities for the government was E.B. Badger Construction Co. out of Boston, Massachusetts. J.D. Kirkland out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana was actually the superintendent of one of these projects and that was the project here out of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. So right behind me is actually one of the domes that was used to store TNT and ammunition at the facility here near Point Pleasant, also known as the West Virginia Ordnance Works. So from September of 1943, when the plant opened, all the way until August 15th of 1945, which was essentially the end of World War II, this plant would produce about 720,000 tons of TNT every single day. By November of 1949, the plant would be completely shut down, everything would be disposed of, uh, except for they would leave some of the pools around that would be used for the red and yellow wastewater. Those reservoirs were actually fenced off because they were considered to be non-hazardous, there wasn't any issue, they weren't leaking out, there was, as far as the federal government was concerned, they were safe. So after being shut down, the land would kind of be divided up and it would change hands a lot over the years. Ultimately, 2,400 acres would end up in the hands of the Conservation Commission of West Virginia. And it would use that land to make the McClintic Wildlife Management Area. Now the area would be used for hunting and fishing by the locals as well as a place to park for local area teams. And locals would refer to the area as the TNT area rather than calling it the McClintic Wildlife Management Area. Probably because it's easier but also because of the, the history of it. So this bunker is just one of many in the area. We're going to check out a few of them today um, as we relay more of the story and we're going to check out this one right here right behind me. So I'm going to attempt to record just a, just a brief minute here to give you guys an idea of this place. It's a rather large place. The acoustics are crazy. <laughs> every little sound, every little noise reverberates all throughout the building because it's just a giant dome and I, I don't know I got some b-roll so I'll, I'll show the b-roll here but I don't know that that'll do it justice just for the size and scope of one of these bunkers so we're gonna go check out some other ones down the way and just kind of check out this place in general as we tell the story of what happened on November 15th 1966 
out the second bunker. <laughs> We've been walking along checking these bunkers out. This is the second one along the way and I wanted to go ahead and kind of get into the story a little bit of what happened on November 15, 1966. Steve and Mary Millette, along with Roger and Linda Scarberry, were two married couples. They were hanging out at the TNT area. They had taken their car out. They were, they were all young. They were all in their late teens, early 20s. And they had taken their car out to kind of just joy ride around and, and hang out, which is what, what people did back then. <laughs> just drive out to the TNT area. They had drag racing. They had all kinds of cool stuff that they would do. So they were out there. It was late. It was around 11.30 or midnight. And so it was real dark, and they were coming up over a hill near what used to be an old abandoned power plant. Now, as they were coming up over a hill, they would spot something standing in the road that looked like it had bright red eyes. They were, they were glowing eyes, and it was a big looking monster, as far as they could tell. But they only saw it for a brief second. According to the testimony of Linda Carberry, she actually said it kind of hobbled, it looked like it was having trouble walking and it had its arms spread out as it was running around the side of the power plant. Now immediately, Roger brought the car to a stop and they just kind of looked at each other and they were trying to figure out what exactly was going on and this thing had disappeared, but they thought that maybe it might come back and they were all kind of freaked out. So Roger decided he was just gonna gun it and they were gonna just head back to town. Now they thought they were in the clear until they got onto US Route 62 to head back to Point Pleasant. When they got on Route 62, they were coming around a set of curves and they saw another, what looked like the same creature that was sitting up on a billboard around one of the curves on the hill. And as soon as their headlights hit it, it flew off. It, and they said it looked like it took off like a helicopter, like it took straight off into the air. Roger, at this point, decided he was just gonna, he was gonna gun it and he was gonna go even faster. And reportedly, he said that on the way back, they hit speeds of up to 100 miles per hour. Now, as they were driving back, this creature was coming and it was flying around the back of the car and it, 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 they could see its eyes, they could see it coming down and swooping around the car and it was keeping up with them even at the 100 miles an hour that they said that they were going. Now, as they started getting closer to what was known as the resort, which was just outside of town, the thing kind of disappeared and they thought maybe, maybe they were in the clear, maybe the lights of the resort had scared it away. And they got past the resort and it got dark again and then all of a sudden it came out of nowhere and it came back down and like it was trying to attack their car. And this is when they started to approach the farm of C.C. Lewis. And as they got close to the gate, which was just on the outskirts of town, the thing flew off and it disappeared into the darkness. And by the time they got into town, it was nowhere to be seen. Now they decided to kind of collect their thoughts. They all went to the Dairyland and they pulled up and they parked and it was this, you know, this little ice cream establishment that was there. And, and they were trying to figure out, well, what did we see? Did we actually see what we thought we saw? You know, and, and they, the girls were saying, maybe we should go to the police. And the guys were like, well, but if we go to the police, they aren't going to believe us because we're going to get out there and it's not going to be there anymore. And then the police are going to, we're going to get laughed at. So they decided they, they should head back out at least to the farm and see if maybe it was still around. Now, as they approached the farm, they didn't see anything at first. And so they thought, well, okay, maybe it's just kind of taken off. And they decided to turn around. And as they turned around to come back, the headlights on the car actually landed on what looked to be a dead animal probably a dog laying in the, in the roadway that they had missed somehow when they were driving out. And as this thing had caught their attention, all of a sudden something came running through on the one side of the road and jumped over their car, over the back of the car, and disappeared into the cornfield off to the side. And they knew that this had to be the creature again, and so they gunned it and they took off back into town. So once they got back to town, they wanted to go into Tiny's Drive-In, which was the only open place, and they ran into somebody they knew named Gary, and they asked him to call the police. Now, Gary at first was a little skeptical. He was like, have you guys been drinking? Have you been doing drugs? What's been going on? And they were like, no, no, we saw this thing. We swear this is what we saw. Call the police. So he goes ahead and he calls the police. So Deputy Miller Halstead actually came out and he talked to the kids and they all said, you know, they had this, this they saw this thing. They weren't drunk. They, they weren't on drugs. Nothing, nothing was going on that was out of the ordinary for them. And Deputy Halstead, he knew these kids pretty well and he knew they were really worked up for a reason, so they must have seen something. So he agreed to go in and check out and see if he could figure out what it was they saw. So before he would leave to go out, they would actually they would actually take the car and they would go out with Gary following them to head kind of back out into the general area while Deputy House they got ready so that he could go out as well. So they drive up and down the road a little bit and they wouldn't see anything. And so they wound up going back to the drive-in and they, pile, they all piled into Gary's car and they headed back out together one last time to see if they could maybe spot something. And as I got out near the power plant again, they saw what they thought might have been the creature. And as they saw it standing off in the distance, Deputy House said pulled up as well. 
and when he came up, the creature disappeared again. Now, while they were sitting at the powerhouse, they would actually hear a noise that Linda Scarber in her testimony later would actually say sounded a lot like it was the squeaking of a mouse, except for much, much louder. Now, Mary and Linda would both say in their testimonies that they saw a shadow that was slinking across the building, and they weren't quite sure what it was. And they would tell the officer, but without telling him where exactly they had seen it, he shined his light in the same general area where they had been looking, where they thought they saw it, but there was nothing there. Now, they would all go back to the home of Roger and Linda, and they wound up staying together in the same house that night, and I would imagine probably just kind of sitting up and freaking out about what this thing was that they saw, because to them it was something that they had no, they'd never seen anything like it in the area, and so they were really worried about this. Now, Deputy Halstead would actually hold a press conference the next day to let people know about this potential issue, this potential thing that was out here, and to let people know to keep an eye out for it. And this would spark a massive search. People would be heading out in the next few days would just be full of people combing the TNT area, men walking around in hunting parties, carrying guns around. I would imagine a very dangerous situation being in the dark out here. I can imagine this place is probably pitch black at night and carrying your rifle around and probably a flashlight, but still, that had to be a really freaky situation for the next few days. Now, in addition over those next few days and even the next few months, there would be a rash of sightings a lot of other people would claim to have seen the same thing and they would claim to have seen it even at night they would claim to have seen it in the day, in one sighting in the daytime there's somebody that actually shot and killed a snowy owl that was down in the area that really didn't belong in the area <laughs> they're not native to west virginia and they don't normally come down this far but apparently there was one that was hanging out at somebody's barn and it was shot and killed now the actual police reports that three of the four members of the group would fill out happened a couple of days after the initial sighting so most likely what happened was over the over those couple of days they were probably spent a lot of time talking back and forth trying to figure out what exactly they had seen and solidifying their ideas you know one of those situations where maybe one person had seen something somebody else hadn't and when they were talking about it you know it sparked something and so by the time they wrote the story down they were all pretty similar stories with a few minor differences as you would expect in between Three different people writing what had happened <laughs> about an event so it was kind of interesting to read through those stories and just kind of see what people you know what, what they thought they saw and their recollection after a couple of days and the description of the creatures that was given was actually pretty consistent with them they said it was six feet tall and it had two big red eyes that were about two inches in diameter and the eyes were about six to eight inches apart they also said that it had a 10 foot wing spread so this is a very very large wing spread for a six foot tall imagine a man like six foot tall man with 10 foot wings out to the side all right so now we're here in downtown point pleasant we're right across the street from the mothman museum which is right over here over my shoulder and we're sitting in front of the mothman statue which is right up here so the Mothman statue was created by an artist named Bob Roach and it was erected in 2003 and revealed at the Mothman Festival, which is an annual festival that's been happening since 2002 right here in Point Pleasant. The Mothman Museum over here actually opened up in 2005, so a couple of years difference there from when things started to kind of pick up. And the reason it started to pick up was actually because of the Mothman Prophecies movie, which was released in 2002. So the question remains. What exactly did the couple see on that cold November night in 1966? So shortly after the reports started spreading everywhere about this mythical creature that might have been spotted in, in the TNT area, one intrepid reporter actually went and found a professor at West Virginia University by the name of Robert Smith and asked him what he thought the creature could be. He specialized in animals and he, he would kind of have a good idea and based on the description, he actually thought it sounded like it was probably a sandhill crane. Now sandhill cranes stand about three to four feet tall and they're known to have a big red spot around their eyes. So it would have been something that would have easily reflected in the light or been seen in the light to look like a big red eye. Now there's been a lot of debate over the years because sandhill cranes weren't really known, especially at the time, to be in West Virginia. They do follow a migratory path that takes them kind of close to the area. And since then there actually have been several documented sightings of sandhill cranes in the West Virginia area, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that it could have been a sandhill crane. 
Now, while the town has clearly embraced the entire idea of the Mothman over the past 20 years or so, it should be noted that three of the four witnesses actually filled out reports for the police to kind of detail what they saw. And those reports actually became public and are actually stored in the Mothman Museum across the street now for anybody to read. And the women in those reports both said that they felt like everybody in town was kind of laughing at them. They felt like they were kind of being made fun of behind their backs shortly after the sightings. Now, while the people in the town might have been making fun of them, one person actually showed up to take them very seriously, and that was a man by the name of John Keel. Now, John Keel was actually a ufologist who spent his life chasing the paranormal and unknown and, and just kind of strange oddities. He was a very big proponent of you know, UFOs and interdimensional type of aliens and the men in black, and it was, it was a whole thing with him. <laughs> and he actually came to West Virginia at the time kind of following up on some UFO reports and wound up tracking down this whole Mothman thing and kind of connecting the dots and and spinning it all together and saying that it was somehow related to the UFOs and the men in black and even tied it all together with what would be the Silver Bridge collapse in 1967. So John Keel was actually one of the primary reasons why the Mothman became so big. In 1975, he wrote a book called The Mothman Prophecies. And in 2002, that would actually be made into a movie that would kind of propel the Mothman into international fame. Now, one of the claims in the book that John Keel makes ties the Mothman to the Silver Bridge. And in the next video, we're actually going to take a look at the Silver Bridge tragedy and what happened on a fateful day in December of 1967. So with all that, I want to thank you all for watching. Make sure to tune in for the next video. Subscribe if you haven't already so that you don't miss out on that one and other great videos that we have coming up. We're just getting started in the West Virginia tales, so we've got a lot to cover. But I want to thank you all for watching. Everybody have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one. Hello. to aid in the war effort, the government would wind up incentivizing, incentivizing? <laughs> J.D. Kirkland out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was the superintendent of this pro of these projects, or one of these projects. This bunker behind me is just one of a ton of bunkers. They said there's hundreds. You were reading the thing. And this is when they started to approach. This feels so crooked. Uh. All right, so now we're here in downtown Point Pe Point Peasant. <laughs> Point Peasant. <laughs> and sitting in front of the Mothman statue. And there's a train. Why is there always a train? <laughs> the minute I start recording, that happened when I was doing the Dogman video. <laughs> you never know what you're gonna get. And the reason it started to pick up was actually because of the Mothman Prophecies movie, which was released in 2002, I think correct it in post if I have to. So the question remains, what exactly did the couple see on that night in... So the question remains of what exactly did those couples see on that night in 1966 